now. And I see the little icon that says recording in progress. So for the 54, 50 or so of you who are here, uh, we are recording the uh, seminar and I hope we'll be able to post the link to the uh, QIRG mailing list uh, later. So uh, if you speak up and or turn your video on, you may be recorded. Yes. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, let me hand over to Mehdi now. Uh, final reminder, if uh, uh, if you still haven't filled out the blue sheets, please fill them out. Uh, and now, uh, Mehdi, uh, the floor is yours. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so I, I, I cannot find the, I, th I don't think if the turning the video option is still on. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, because I, that's why I stopped sharing. I thought it's something that doesn't show. Okay, uh, in that case, we'll just have to live without the video. Uh, something that's to right, figure okay. out for the next seminar, <laughs> at least we'll know. Uh, <laughs> awesome, so least... let me quickly share this back and go. Okay, I hope you all are seeing my screen. Uh, I see your screen, yes. Yeah. It's very, very hard if you're not seeing this screen. Awesome. I'm very, very happy to be here. I hope everyone is having a good day, afternoon, night, depending on where you are. I'm guessing I'm the only one in the uh, East Coast in the morning time. Uh, so for the next like 30 minutes, 40 minutes or so, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the work that we're doing here at QNEC. It's a startup in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, hi, Medi. Can you please speak up? Somebody mentioned you're hardly audible. Uh, oh, sure, we'll sure. Closer to the microphone. Thank you. Okay, I, I hope it's better, but uh, feel free to leave the chat. I don't know if I'm seeing the chat notes. Oh, okay, now I, I open the chat option also to see. Okay. Yeah, so, so for the next half an hour or so, uh, I'll be, I see people have issues with the audio, yeah? I hear you very clearly, so. Oh, you uh, do? Okay. Okay. And some people has already pointed out that the audio is fine for them. Uh, I'd say continue, and if somebody has a problem, can they contact me in the chat? And we'll okay, fantastic. Yeah. So, so yeah, for half an hour or forty minutes, I'll talk a little bit about the things we're doing at Qnex to develop practical uh, uh, the elements of necessary for a practical quantum network that operates at room temperature. What I mean by practical quantum network is that not only devices that operate and show the quantum performances you need. In, in our cases, mainly we are, we are focused on uh, quantum memories and entanglement sources, but also devices that are robust and feel deployable enough that they have a perspective to go out there, be integrated into different networks, eventually into the telecom infrastructure, and, and can be reliably used for, let's say, five to 10 years without that much maintenance. It's a big difference compared to how quantum uh, computation scheme is so we we of course uh, avoid technologies that need cryogenic uh, cooling or even uh, laser cooling magneto optically uh, trapped atoms and things like this uh, so the focus of this talk is going to be mainly on the challenges that it takes to to develop these technologies at room temperature and make them work robustly for for extended amount of time so we don't need to keep sending grad students across the country <laughs> to 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 fix things every time something goes wrong uh, okay, let me see. Okay, yeah, awesome. So, you all are in this this panel, so I'm guessing this slide is a little bit redundant for you. Why we care about quantum networking? I'm gonna do my best to entire entirety of this, this talk to avoid the use of the word quantum internet. So when I'm saying quantum network, I mean a much 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 simpler, everything excluded, all classical layers ex excluded of the future uh, quantum internet networks if they ever happen, but, but quantum networking is just, just all the quantum elements of the, the network. One of the key reasons people really like these is that it gives us this option of eventually connecting quantum computers to each other because that really gives us this ability to harvest the full potential of these, these computers as they're getting developed. Of course, one of the main applications or no most known applications of quantum networking is the secure communication, which to scientists is one of the most boring application of quantum is as, as basic as it gets, but but it works and, it, and it's great. So I always put them in these slides, but quantum networking can be used for so many applications, not only pretty much connecting anything that has a quantum nature in it, and you want to preserve that quantum nature uh, if you want to have a network quantum sensing and a, a telescope arrays of optical an array of uh, optical telescopes, quantum computers, pretty much the, the infrastructure for connecting uh, quantum systems to each other. And the field is fortunately moving forward very fast. Uh, 
from the time that these things got a little bit more heated when, uh, when China sent the first quote and unquote quantum satellite up there till this last year that there are like so many of the things that I put here from Caltech all the way to China are all happened in 2020. There are so many researchers across the board that are trying to implement this and network so not only to realize the devices but also like much more focused than individual devices now they are much more focused into the network elements of how these devices are going to come together and work together which is which is of course a very happy side for people like me usually when we talk about quantum uh, networks i don't want to use the word generations either but uh, most of the networks to date especially on the commercial side are just direct qubit transmission ones these are like QKD, quantum key distribution networks, things that you can even right now buy commercially from companies like ID Quantic or, or so. Uh, just the direct thing, Alice sends uh, a bunch of qubits to uh, Bob, mainly with a focus on the security, quantum secure networks. But the downside of these networks are that they are insanely not scalable because you always have to deal with the losses, mainly in the fiber or even free space. So, these networks are always limited to a certain distance. I don't want to make up a distance, but let's say for the sake of this uh, conversation, 100 kilometers or so. And there is not else you can do about the scaling the, the distance up unless you do something like trusted networks and stuff like that. Uh, the second generation or something that is much more heated nowadays is distribution of entanglement in a network that allows you to distribute entanglement. And as long as you have entanglement between Alice and Bob, you don't really care how far they are, thanks to all the magics of quantum. Uh, but the good thing about this is that there are a lot of protocols in distributing entanglement, including entanglement swapping, that, that gives you this prospect and this ability to eventually extend these distances and, and be able to use multiple entanglement sources uh, to, to, to share this entanglement between Alice and Bob uh, the further away they are from each other. So many experiments have been done. I actually should update this slide a little bit because to include what's been done last year in Caltech and other research groups as well. Uh, but this is something that is happening. But as you can see, even from this plot and even the most recent stuff, we are usually stuck to distances of under like 50 kilometers or so. Entanglement is amazing. Quantum in general is amazing, but it's incredibly hard to maintain these properties the moment you leave, leave a lab in your environment. So very, very soon uh, you lose the entangled states. And that's why these experiments are usually limited in distances. Now, uh, what I mean with entanglement distribution, there are so many different protocols and different ways people, people trying to envision this, this distribution of entangled photons. Uh, but basically that the concept is a little bit uh, simple. The general concept is that, let's say I start with two entanglement sources, uh, these infinity signs, and each of them are generating a pair of entangled photons here. I don't care what type of entanglement they have, let's say polarization. And these sources are 100 kilometers or so apart from each other. I want to end up sharing a pair of entangled photons with Alice and Bob, who are 200 kilometers apart from each other. Of course, the most obvious uh, answer is to put an entanglement source right in between them, send one up, one down. Uh, but we want to find a way that the overall loss is less than the loss you have to endure when you send things to long fibers because the loss in optical fibers are exponentially increasing. So after a certain kilometers, it's just a meaningless thing to do if you the direct transmission of these photons. So, so the trick is relatively simple, although the implement is incredibly hard, uh, but there are a few, uh, in, uh, a few elements you usually need in these networks, for example, not all entanglement sources are naturally made for, for telecom. Oh, let me turn on my uh, laser pointer. Yeah, so not all entanglement sources are made to operate at telecom uh, wavelengths, but obviously fibers would much rather have those wavelengths to, to at least give you the minimum uh, loss possible. So you either usually need to do a frequency conversion before entering your fibers, or if you build your entanglement sources at telecom, like 1550 or something, Usually after it comes out of the fiber, you need to do some, some conversion because uh, it's not that simple to have just entanglement sources. You need elements, for example, like quantum memories in your network. Quantum memories do play a very critical role in terms of uh, buffering and synchronization. Uh, so it's what quantum memories do for these protocols is that uh, they take entanglement sources that are not deterministic. So you don't know when you're generating these entanglement pairs. 
and synchronize this protocol. So after the quantum memories, you always know that you, you have these photons coming out. And the main reason you care about this is that the, the main process of swapping the entanglement, quote and unquote, is happening in this uh, joint uh, photon measurement device, this ballasted measuring device here. All this device is doing is, is a very, very interesting process. It grabs one photon from one source, one photon from the other source, does a measurement on them that results in entangling the other remote photons that they never met each other. So this entanglement swapping can happen as long as the photons arrive to the ballistic measuring pretty much uh, overlapping at the same time. So within like a two nanosecond interval or so, quantum memories play as the role of the, the buffering. The quantum frequency converters are the interface between the entanglement sources, frequency uh, uh, telecom fibers and the quantum memories. And eventually uh, you have an entangled pair of photon between Alice and Bob. I make it sound simple, but but in practice, uh, we've been trying, and by we, I mean the whole science community, have been trying for decades, and we still yet to show that this a network as sophisticated as this can be the uh, loss of, of a typical fiber uh, transmission. Now, at QNECT, we look at how can we make something like this the most practical version of it, and one of one thing that makes things practical is simplicity. So we slightly have changed this, these protocols and adopted to a protocol that at least we hope has uh, give us the, the result much faster and much more robust. The, the main difference that is happening here uh, is, is at these entanglement sources. Yeah, so one of the things we're doing here is that we are developing these entanglement photons. I will talk about them during this conversation also, uh, that generate the pairs of photons that are entangled in polarization space, but these are bichromatic sources as of the photons do not share the same wavelength. In fact, we can design them to one have a wavelength much closer to the telecom, for example, 1320 nanometers, 1330 nanometers or so, uh, which has uh, less loss. And the other one is at 795 nanometers. Very soon you'll see why 795 nanometers, but those are the wavelengths that we use for our quantum memories, and those are the wavelengths the quantum memory requires. So in this way, we can have an entanglement source that is simultaneously compatible with both the uh, quantum memories and the and the telecom fibers. So the way we can have these nodes uh, set up, for example, in a version that you see right here, uh, anything that you see blue is at telecom wavelength, anything that you see red is at 795 wavelengths, near IR uh, wavelength. So in, in a protocol like this, these two entanglement sources on the right side gonna release the photons that goes through the long fibers. These are the very telecom fibers while the memories next to them are just going to store the 795 photons, so they're going to store the other photons. Uh, simultaneously, the other left entanglement sources are, are going to also release. Anytime a successful bell, bell state swapping happens here in these two nodes, they're going to send a signal to the central node, and the quantum memories are going to release their photons. We'll do a bell state measuring here, which will result in entangling the two further out uh, quantum memories. And this is very daisy chainable. You can have, well, you can't have infinite of them, but as long as your devices are low loss, you can keep increasing the number of these nodes you have in your network and, and keep swapping the entanglement further and further. Why do we like this protocol? Uh, one of the reasons is because, of course, it has its own obvious reason that this is, this is a buffered uh, quantum repeater. Which, which allows you to, to beat the loss in the fiber transmissions and if, uh, have a better rate than direct transmission. But it's also, first of all, optically transparent when it gets to the fiber uh, line. I'm not putting anything here uh, between the photons that goes to the ballistic measuring, so there is no uh, quantum memory in this link or frequency converter, which gives me a better future of mixing these photons uh, using multiplexing or something with uh, with everything else that's going through those fibers if you want to have hybrid digital uh, quantum networks. Another very good thing about this is that, as you can see, of course, we don't need frequency conversion, anything which really, really simplifies things. There is a huge different level of like having three quantum devices and two quantum devices that need to work together. And this is also a conversation I'm not going to dive into, but this, this network structure needs the minimum amount of heralding. So a lot of times I don't need necessarily my quantum memories to be heralded. I don't need my quantum memories to have 
very insane like a storage times you can adjust these networks for a quantum memory that has a reasonable storage time of like a millisecond or so and as long as i have a few anchor nodes across the network that can herald the system i can always uh, implement these protocols with, with uh, high fidelities and, and defeat the loss another good thing about this is that the devices that we are building are designed to eventually all be multiplex so so you don't need to have just one layer of these things the quantum memory itself the entanglement sources everything can be multi uh, multiplex so you generate many pairs of photons simultaneously your quantum memory can store many uh, many of these photons simultaneously so you can scale everything up by just uh, simply multiplexing and throughout this talk if i forget this to mention this everything here works at room temperature so these are the devices that have a much better future of being integrated into the telecom hubs everywhere uh, because, because you don't need to go and have a whole infrastructure of cardiogenic systems everywhere you go. And uh, now I'll, I'll sweep through this slide a little bit uh, faster, but the whole main point of here is to just show that, uh, of course, as you expect for, for any, with, with any basic calculation, you can show that a protocol like this has a much, much better transmission uh, or, or can defeat the loss over long distances much better than direct transmission, which I'm showing here with this blue line. Uh, so, so something like this can, uh, these repeaters can allow you to defeat the exponential loss and turn it to something much more manageable, a uh, polynomial loss uh, uh, versus the distance of the fibers. I don't know where my labels went. So, so this is the distance and this is your uh, loss that you in there. Another important thing here is that you don't need to wait for perfect quantum devices before these, these protocols work. Right now, the green and the yellow line, uh, these are the overall efficiency of the memory to be at 15 or 40%. So even a 15% uh, efficient quantum memory at very short distances of, let's say, well, not short, very short distances, but here it's around 180 kilometers or so, you can start getting advantages over direct transmission. Of course, for, for these plots, there have been like, insane number of assumptions and simplifications here, but but at the end of the day, this is always what you expect to get a polynomial loss compared to an exponential loss. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about, but it won't be that much focus of this conversation, is the uh, at QNEC, not only we're building these quantum hardware devices, so we are building the entanglement sources, the quantum memories, and the much more simpler devices, these, these Bell state swapping uh, devices. But we also want to have this prospect of eventually integrating these devices into telecom infrastructure, at least for our own field tests, tests, so we can put them out there. So we're developing some additional hardware, we call them our quantum support hardware, that will help make the everything works better in terms of making the infrastructure a little bit more quantum friendly and, and also bring everything together. So just the three of them to, to mention, uh, these quantum memories, these entanglement sources, they all have their own pump lasers. These are at different uh, transitions. We usually use rubidium atoms. I'll talk a little bit later. So these are all need to be these lasers that are comes with these devices. They need to be blocked precisely to the atomic transitions. And so, so we're building these devices. Uh, these these are just normal uh, locking schemes, but but every device can lock four to eight different lasers simultaneously. So you don't need to have multiple of these things everywhere uh, in, in a rack mount design. Uh, time synchronization is incredibly important in these networks because, as I was mentioning, the the Bell state swapping stations really care about when the photons are arriving because these are joint measurements. So if if your photons are nanosecond align with photons, you need them to arrive within the same, and you need the whole network to be synchronized time-wise. Everything that you do, the pulsing of your pumps, the pulsing of your control field that stores these photons, everything needs to be done uh, within nanosecond time frame. So we are building these devices that you that can be used as to trigger all the electronics uh, down to sub-nanosecond uh, precision. And another element that we're building are the automated polarization compensating devices. All the telecom infrastructure, telecom fibers are made for uh, optical communications, but they're not made for like actual single photon carrying quantum information type of communications. So they're really not that great in preserving the, the quantum information you encode on your photons. And regardless of what type of polarization of what type of uh, encode you're using, uh, quantum encode you're using for your photons, you always have to maintain the polarization 
these fibers are not polarization maintaining. You always have to compensate for it because these stations really care about indistinguishability of your photons. So even if you have time being qubits, but your polarization of photons are different, you start feeling a very significant loss. I'll show this actually in one of the slides when you want to do these swappings. And so, so our, our automated polarization compensating device can do the job for you that it calibrates the system using some uh, reference photons to make sure that it compensates for what the fibers are doing to your photons. And our eventual goal is to be able to put all these devices into what we call our eventual product, the quantum rack uh, modules where everything is rack mounted, everything is ready for let's say a fiber hub or something, you can just put one of these racks in and depending on the node that you have, of course, the structure of the rack is a little bit different, but everything is built to be modular and very, very easy to mix and match based on your need in different nodes. Kind of ignore this. I always put this here because, because I made this plot and I really like it. But the good thing about this is these protocols is that when you use these hybrid entanglement sources, it also allows you to create hybrid quantum networks that are both uh, fiber based and free space based. Uh, because a good thing about being at near IR wavelengths like 795 or so is that it's also a suitable wavelength for, for uh, Earth to satellite to Earth communications or free space links. So you can always eventually have links that are uh, enhanced by satellite uh, satellite networks, future quantum networks uh, that can create these quantum repeaters and extend the distance significantly by, by these hybrid protocols. Now, I talked about all the beautiful stuff, so let's talk a little bit about the challenges. The list of the challenges are pretty much infinite between where we are right now until we get to, to a robust network that works out there integrated into the telecom. So I'm just going to categorize everything in, in four different like main challenges that I, at least we could think of. Uh, one of the, of course, the main ones is that not only you want very uh, quote and unquote strong quantum devices, devices that are very, very efficient and have very high fidelity at, at quantum levels, like a quantum memory that can store the photons with very high fidelity, but you also want something to be very, very re reliable for years. And this is not that easy as a person who has spent the past eight, 10 years of his life doing experimental uh, quantum physics and stuff. A lot of the experiments that I did, I needed to, during my PhD especially, I needed to stop the experiment literally every 15 minutes or so to readjust something, to fix the temperature and something like that and, and continue. Now we are talking about five to 10 years of uh, robustness, so the scales are jointly different. Uh, the, the other thing that matters, even if when you build these devices, is that in quantum, quantum devices are super needy. All of them, they need their own kind of input, whether like in terms of wavelength, the line width of the, the bandwidth of the photons, what type of photons you're using. So it's very, very important to have a product suit that are compatible with each other. Otherwise, even if you have individual quantum devices that are highly efficient, you're going to massively indoor losses when you link them to each other. Let's say you have both of these, and now you have to deal with the fact that I was just mentioning that these are not directly going to connect, be connected to each other. A lot of times there is going to be a telecom fiber in between. There's going to be a lot of fiber back patches, so many things in between that we as researchers, especially quantum researchers, are not that many familiar with. Uh, so, so it's very, very important to have hardware that can make the telecom infrastructure more quantum friendly. So when you use them to plug your devices, you, you don't suddenly go to efficiencies of like pretty much zero. And if you have all those things, then, then of course, when you go towards the more sophisticated networks, you have to talk about the, the issue that we simply right now don't have any proper protocol that can connect a classical quantum interface networks. This is, this is a big, big issue. Well, right now, no, but very soon then, then you build these elementary networks. Then the next question is that there is a huge gap between what we call a simple or elementary quantum network and what is an actual quantum internet that is going to be integrated into the telecom. So this, this, the last challenge pretty much requires five to maybe 10 years of collaborations between uh, scientists, networks, uh, network scientists, network engineers, everyone together so, so we can adopt these protocols so they can be integrated into the already existing protocols. And, and this is, uh, we, we all seen a lot of proposals nowadays come out from physics labs in QLAN, QVAN and stuff like this. Uh, but, but there are 
not that realistic when it gets into terms of what is actually out there and and these devices need to work with the infrastructures and the protocols that we are currently using for internet eventually i'm talking way way in the future but but this is a research that needs to be pushed forward uh, rather rather soon if you want these things to ever happen now Everything I said so far was introduction, so hopefully I didn't bore you guys. I'll talk a little bit more about our quantum memories, and, and uh, I'm just going to mention quantum memories and entanglement sources with a focus on quantum memories, because that's one of the things we're getting pretty good at after a decade or so of research. There are plenty of ways to create light matter interfaces that would allow you to store temporarily a, a single photon with the polarization or the information encoded on them. And there are an infinite number of researchers out there that are doing infinitely amazing research in the field from using cold atoms, magnetically optically trapped atoms, or literally a single atom uh, trapped in a cavity, all the way to a little bit more solid state stuff like silicon vacancy centers, nitrogen vacancy centers, or the rare earth dopes, uh, crystals are very, very different, very, very interesting protocols to, to store uh, photons. The ones that we are more focused on are the ones down here, the room temperature ensembles, to be able to store and successfully retrieve the photons and the information encoded on them using a rubidium vapor cell that is operating at room temperature. Of course, these are a little bit above room temperature, they're like 60 Celsius or so, but, but nothing cooled, nothing laser trapped, nothing magnetically trapped. Very, very simple uh, system to design. I won't really dive deep into the physics of how these things works, but I have like 50 backup slides or so here, so feel free to ask questions if you have later. Uh, but these uh, systems work basically based on electromagnetically induced transparency uh, technique. EIT is a very elegant method discovered, I don't know even how many years ago, like 30 years ago or so, in which you can induce transparency to, to a medium that is supposed to be naturally absorbed into your photons. By that, what I mean is that we use rubidium atoms. So if I grab my photons and I make sure that my photons are sitting on the transition of B to A and transition of rubidium atoms, I'm showing them with E. Of course, if I send those photons into the medium, into the vapor cell, they're gonna get absorbed because they're literally on resonance uh, with my atoms, yeah? But the good thing is that if I use a strong control field, omega here, that is also on resonance with my, with my atoms through these lambda schemes, I can control the transparency of the medium under proper conditions. Uh, whether this control field is on or off will decide whether the medium is transparent or absorbent for these, these uh, photons. So I can change this by having my control field on and off. I can change the behavior of the medium. This is called electromagnetic induced transparency. And this allows me to create a coherent quantum memory in which uh, this is my vapor cell here. I'll have the control field on the medium is transparent when the control field is on. So when the photon arrives, it can enter the cell. Uh, and while this, the photon is inside the cell, I'll turn off the control memory off adiabatically, uh, slowly. Uh, store my photon, cut and uncut. I have the photon here for, for a certain interval of time. And then I can turn on my control field again and allow the photon to leave the medium and continue its journey. Of course, you're working at room temperature, so and, and you're working at quantum, so everything has a limit. For example, we are here targeting for these photons to be stored in a millisecond time of scale, nothing really further. It's, it's incredibly hard to increase these things, although people have done some very awesome experiments at room temperatures up to second longest storage. But, but for a robust device, it's not that easy. But good thing is that in a lot of these protocols for quantum networking, we don't need anything further than a millisecond or so storage. Now, there is a downside of using uh, room temperature stuff besides the limitation of a storage time, and that's the, the giant amount of noise you have to fight if you're working at room temperature. So one of the things that I mentioned is the control field itself has to be very strong, and in this case, because of the Doppler broadening, it has to co-propagate with your input uh, qubits. Uh, so every time that I successfully store and retrieve one good photon, now I need to deal with two very large categories of noises and very vastly different. The first one I call them usually technical noises. These are noises directly coming from your laser itself. For example, the fact that, that it's, it's a laser field, the control field, so you have to be able to filter 10 to the power of 14 different unwanted photons uh, without destroying your one good photon. This is a massive amount of filtering required. It's doable. 
and we're getting very good at it, uh, thanks to the fact that these photons are 6.8 gigahertz different in frequency compared to your good photons, and a lot of times you can design them to be perpendicularly polarized uh, to your good photons. Another thing that you have to get rid of is the, the ASE noise of your laser itself. This is the amplified spontaneous emission noise, by which it means nothing is perfect, even if I have a laser that is lasing at this very, very specific uh, wavelength, it is still doing it with a certain uh, efficiency, so there, it is still emits photons at very, very low powers uh, that are several nanometers or so wide, you need to be able to also filter that. The reason these are different is because you can't just simply use optical cavities or, uh, or things like that to filter something that is like 20 nanometers wide. And of course, the dark, dark counts and everything comes into play. We're, you're working at single photon levels. Uh, even if you do all those things, you have to deal with the fact that you're at room temperature, you're shining a strong control field into a medium that is hot. So your medium itself, this control field can interact with your atoms and create a bunch of new uh, sources of noise for you. The most uh, easiest one to, to, to talk about is the spontaneous Raman scattering. Is this, this case that uh, when, when I have the control field here, uh, if my, my states are not perfectly pumped out, if not all these atoms are empty, even if I have a few atoms left in these states, that's enough to start pumping them up and create a spontaneous emission of these photons that are now exactly at the same wavelength as my good photons. So my, my optical cavities are, for example, useless for those things. There are several pro atomic processes that can happen that can result in photons that are much harder to filter than your just technical noise uh, photons. Uh, so one of the things we have been doing in the past, like nine years or so, nine months or so, especially at, at QNEC, is to find optimal ways of getting rid of each of these. So not only we engineer the hardware to be very robust in filtering the technical noise, we also quantum engineer the, the interaction itself to suppress all the possible atomic noises to, to minimize these noises because, because our because they are pretty much immune to, to our filtering system. So we do need to engineer them inside the vapor cell to make sure they're not happening. Now, another thing that we do, of course, this matters quite a lot, is that these quantum memories should be able to not only store the single photons themselves, but also the, the, the information encoded on them. We really like polarization. So these, these quantum memories are built to, to store polarization. Uh, and we can do that simply with the trick of a dual rail quote and unquote quantum memory, all I need to do, I'll make it sound simple, but, but pretty much all I need to do is to grab my qubit that is in a superposition of polarization state and map that superposition into a superposition of special superposition. So the up and down rail superposition using optical elements like a beam displacer. And now I just store them separately and identically inside the vapor cell at the same time and then eventually recombine them back into, or map them back into the polarization state. So this way I can preserve the polarization. And just to show you how it looks like, one of the things that we are very, very proud of is how low noise our quantum memories, especially the prototypes that we're building right now are. This is an example on the left side, is an example of a storage of a, a pulse with average one photon uh, per pulse that is a storing for like a micro, two microsec a microsecond or so. Uh, for, for some reasons, we're doing this at low efficiencies uh, to, to match with some uh, previous data. So this part that you're seeing here is the part that we could successfully store, but with 5% efficiency. But even at those low efficiencies, you can just compare it to the noise, the background noise. We can achieve signal to background ratios of 20, 30 plus, which is, which is very high because that corresponds to, to fidelity, the storage fidelity is up 96% plus, which at room temperature is, is, I'm still fascinated, honestly, that these things work. And, and on, the, uh, on the right side, I have the Poincare sphere. So uh, just, just to show that you can send any arbitrary polarizations to these quantum memories as your input signals. And if you measure the output signals, you, you, you get the same photons, but a little bit shrank because you're, you're, you still have noise and you still have to deal with those things. So you can really have a quantum memory that stores polarization uh, pretty much with very, very high efficiency. I'm sorry, very, very high fidelity. Now, the good thing of dealing with room temperature is that if you manage to, to over 
overcome all the challenges of noise and coherence time and stuff like this. Now it gives you the perspective of field deployability. Uh, we, we started with these experiments. These are the things I did during my PhD at Stony Brook University. So there is this massive optical table with so many elements that is the quantum memory. This is our very, very first uh, prototype of quantum memory coming out of QNX. It's right now actually ready for our very first sale to, to research customers. Uh, significantly smaller and has all the elements in it. And now we're developing the next generation. I'll tell you why we're developing this in a second, which we expect to have it uh, ready by before the end of this year. These are rack mounted U2 size, so very, very suitable to just put them in, in a rack setup and use them much, much smaller and robust. So we have a very clear path of not only making things smaller, but cheaper and more robust and, and in the engineering side and everything. Now, uh, I think I'm talking in a way that this, this talk is going to go till like four or five hours from now. So I'll try to pick up the pace and, and jump over a couple of slides so I can also talk a little bit about the entanglement sources. Uh, but this is a little bit uh, about the, the versions that are different like uh, generations or different marks of the quantum memories that we're building at QNEC. Our short term ultimate goal is this mark one here this is a quantum memory that we will have ready by the end of next year that can store photons with an efficiency of 40 percent but the photons can maintain their polarization with the, with the fidelity of better than 98 percent the overall transmission of this system is going to be high these are not easy to increase the transmission because you deal with so many optical cavities and everything we are aiming for coherence times of above 500 microsecond which will give us uh, the, the performance that we need uh, for, for short term quantum networks, medium length quantum networks. And, and these devices are now designed to be a stable for, for more than a month without need any, without the need of any like adjustment on our side. One of the things we are doing that I did not get a chance yet to talk about whatsoever is the software suit of these, these hardwares. We know engineering, engineering alone is not going to take us that far. We're talking about devices that are sensitive to temperature change down to millikelvin. They're sensitive to the adjustment of the lasers where the laser hits down to like a few 10 micrometer or so. Uh, so we are trying to use uh, some basic machine learning algorithms to make our devices uh, self-diagnose and self-optimize themselves during the downtime of the network so the quantum memory can just light run a light through different elements and recognize what's going wrong and just all optimize the temperature or optimize the alignment a little bit so it always stays uh, optimized now i am gonna go to to quantum source i do see some messages uh, popping up uh, people talking in in the background if the questions are for me feel free to ask at any point especially now because i'm going to talk a little bit about the quantum sources uh, it's just that they come to my screen and then they disappear before i can read so i don't no, so in that case, maybe we can uh, field a question or or two. So uh, there there were two questions. One of from Olaf, which was answered by Rod, but there's also a question from Kian. Thank you, Rod. Uh, Kian, would you like to ask a question, or shall I ask it? Um, you, you can hear me. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. No, I I was just actually wondering in this specific scheme why you were so sort of. Uh, putting emphasis on that you needed these memories, uh, but I guess I uh, now we're getting to your sources, and I think that completes the story as to why you want to store your entangled state in something else than what you use to make your entanglement. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that that's a very good question. I'll just quickly go back to it to to explain where the quantum memory exactly came in, and and then uh, we'll talk about the entanglement sources. Yeah. So this is where the quantum memory comes in is in this one critical step that I said, all it does is very simple, yeah? It allows you to first wait for these two remote bell state swapping to happen successfully before you release this and then do this. So my, my, this, this very small node that I have here does not need to rely on the successful swapping of all these three stations at the same time. It can just break this into two, two networks. Anytime these two successfully done, it can release the photons and do this here. Why do this come into the play is because the moment I increase this number of nodes, because everything is probabilistic in these, these networks, and there is a certain probability for this to successfully do the swapping, because for this to, to successfully swap, 
means that successfully two photons need to arrive there, but these entanglement sources generate photons, for example, for you at, at a rate of 5%. So every 100 times that you pulse them, only five times they actually generate the photons for you. And we're usually forced to keep them at these very low numbers if you want to make sure that we're not creating that many uh, bunching photons. Uh, so, so for this to happen, the probability is always very low. So if I need to, if I have a network that cannot synchronize and buffer so i can wait for some of these to do to, to successfully and then i do the other ones i'll end up with this problem that i have like 100 bell state swapping that all need to somehow happen successfully simultaneously for me to be able to to uh, implement these networks when i scale them up uh, which which is statistically speaking impossible so all these memories are doing is by breaking these networks into sub uh, sections it increased the probability because right now, if, if something goes wrong here, uh, these memories, these two memories can keep, if, if this one goes wrong, for example, but the other one can do it successfully, I can keep my photons while this guy repeats again and again and again until it does successfully, and then I release my photons. But if I don't have the quantum memories, if the left one does it successfully, the right one fails, I have to get rid of the left, discard the left one, repeat again, repeat again until it happens. So it makes it much more, uh, the in, in affects the rate significantly to have the quantum memories in a protocol like this. Yeah, uh, thank and, you. and it's really not about the type of entanglement sources we build. It's pretty much about all entanglement sources. Are the, it's the inter in the deterministic nature of the sources that cause this issue, this requirement. Okay, so the quantum uh, sources. So I said a lot of things that you you would want to have a, for these quantum memories, but for the sources you also have a bunch of requirements requirements. First of all, you want something that is easy to eventually integrate into the telecom infrastructure. At least we care about that because we want to build something that has the prospect of being integrated into the telecom infrastructure. But you also want something that is, uh, you can integrate it into a multi-modular quantum network, for example, quantum memories, or eventually like quantum sensors, quantum processors. So if you're using ion traps, quantum computers, atomic quantum computers, uh, quantum sensors, a bunch of them are actually based on these ruby gummies atoms, also like magnetometers, gravitometers. All these devices have their own specific requirements, so they don't work at telecom, actually none of those that I gave as an example. So they want also their, their own type of photons and the line bitwise are also very, very sensitive. Uh, you want to be also eventually have this concept of hybrid free space, free space networks. So it's good to develop a source that works for that. Obviously you want something the more uh, bright it is and the more efficient the source uh, it is, the better. But at the same time, you need it to be very robust field deployable. So you pretty much need everything uh, for these sources. Yeah, they really need to satisfy so many conditions uh, before you can take them out there and implement them. Now, entanglement sources compared to quantum memories are devices that right now you could commercially buy out there. There are companies that sell them and the research is uh, much more further along. The most common way of building them is using a spontaneous parametric down conversion. So you use these crystals that these are non-linear non crystals that uh, they, they absorb a photon and then they re-emit two photons with the total energy the same. So each of them are half of the energy of your initial photon, but they are correlated in the polarization space, for example. So you can use these techniques to create pairs of photons that are entangled to each other. If you start with a blue pump, you can get two red photons. Uh, that are, for example, frequency entangled with each other. It's a very, very simple process, but it has a couple of downsides that makes them pretty much useless for our applications. The biggest, biggest downside that they have is that the photons that come out are very wide uh, themselves. So the photons are like 10 nanometers, a few nanometers wide. Uh, they're they're uh, in line between the frequency space, which means they are like uh, 2 to 10 terahertz in frequency space wide are quantum memories and a lot of other different quantum devices, ion traps and stuff like this. They do not want anything that is beyond the natural line of the line of your atoms. The quantum memories are even more picky. They want like a megahertz or so. So a lot of these devices, when you interface them, that's one of the things that I was mentioning before. If you're interfacing an entanglement source with a quantum device, you, you need the photons that is at the right wavelength, but also the line, right uh, line width. And in, in this case, these entanglement sources are a factor of like 10,000 or so up. So if, if I have a source right now and connect it to my quantum memory, even if the quantum memory has like a normal efficiency of 100%, the interface efficiency between these are gonna be practically zero. Yeah, it's gonna be a meaningless number. 
And the, the, the other downside of them is that they're usually single wavelength. Yeah, so you can either tune this depending on your pump to create the photons at 795 or to create the photons at 1550, whatever you want usually depending on your uh, pump requirements, but uh, limitations, but, but they usually come at the same as the same color. Yeah, uh, so these are the issues that makes them a little bit useless for us. There are ways to use these crystals to make them much more narrow line, line width. This is a paper, this is a photo from a paper in, in uh, 2016 from Andrew White's group in, in Australia. You can use a cavity uh, to, to enhance these systems. You can do these optical parametric uh, cavities, which pretty much is forces the photons to come out within the line width of the cavity so people can create photons that are megahertz or even narrower. But the downside is that, first of all, your rate is always very, very limited. And these devices are incredibly complicated, uh, complex in terms of for, for, uh, for what's this thing? Uh, robustness for, for something that's field deployable. So actually during my PhD in our research lab at Stony Brook, we are developing these, but, but we kind of a little bit gave up on, on making, making them a commercial product that can interface out there. The method that we like better is these light matter sources. The good thing about rubidium is that not only you can use these atoms for, for, for a surge of light, you can also use them for generation of lights. A lot of this initial uh, quantum repeater protocol, DLCZ protocols and stuff like that, they're based on atomic sources anyway. Uh, and, and you can just create these, so you can create this spontaneous four wave mixing uh, processes, which are pretty much atomic, uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion processes, yeah? So I can use these, uh, techniques to create pairs of photons uh, using my rubidium atoms. Like for example, the one that I have here uh, from a JQI paper in 2010, is it uses a structure like this. So can, I can pump my photons using two different pumps to an excited state, double excited states, two photon resonance excited states. And when this decays and coherently create, uh, gives me two photons, not only these two photons are entangled to each other, mainly because of the degeneracies of these levels, but because these are atoms, I can tune them to come out with two different wavelengths because they have to follow the atomic transitions, yeah? So if you have an atom like rubidium that has transitions closer to telecom or suitable telecom bandwidth like 1367, you can use that to create a pair of photons that are entangled, but one of them is at 780 in this case of their experiment and one is at 1367, which is of course a big win for us because not only these photons are by color, and pretty much on resonance with what you want for the quantum memory because they're generated by the same atoms. We want to do the exact opposite of these people. So we are generating the photons at 795, uh, but, but also the line that is much, much more narrower. So now I'm talking about photons that are sub 50 megahertz and in the range of like 50 megahertz or so compared to 10 terahertz wide. So I'm a factor of 10,000 times right now, more or less better with interfacing with my and quantum memories when it gets to the efficiency. You know? And there are several like different schemes. I'm not gonna go through this. This is a much more recent paper done uh, in a Korean group. I forgot the name of the, the PI right now, but, but this is amazing uh, work that they have done. I really recommend you guys to see this. Uh, they, they have very bright entanglement sources. By very bright, I'm saying these are around like 18 kilohertz, but that's a very high number because the photons are very, very narrow. So this 18 kilohertz makes a lot of more use for us compared to a 200 kilohertz photon that gives you terahertz uh, line bits. The one that we are now developing at QNECT and, and it's at very, very early stage of its developments, QNECT is a very recent lab, is a modified version of what I just showed you, but with a little bit of more multiplexing and, we can, and, and redesigning of the atomic layers that we're gonna use, we can generate entangled photons that are at 795 and 1324 nanometer line bits but, but our aim is to create a source that can have somewhere around a generation rate of one megahertz or so. So we really can boost everything by, by multiplexing my, our photon generation rates without really causing like a lot of photon bunching and stuff like that. Uh, so these devices, hopefully when we have them, which will be uh, the preliminary results for them, they're gonna come out uh, in, in summer this year's and hopefully we have them in a much more modular version uh, next year in Q3 or something. And uh, these devices can can operate much, much better with our quantum memories and are much more suitable for integration into the quantum networks. 
Now, I think I've been certainly over talking, so I'll just finish this with just two more minutes of uh, talking that we not only we're building these quantum devices, we also really, really care about being able to test them into the VTVT in infrastructure. So we do a lot of partnerships with Stony Brook University and Brookhaven National Lab. And because they are local and also one of our co-founders is my PhD advisor, who is a scientist in both these institutes, and he's still working on these uh, networking aspects of the research. And uh, so, so we do a lot of, uh, we have plans and currently started a lot of field testing using buried fibers that are already between BNL and Stony Brook. These are the ones we have access to them uh, right now which allows us to, to integrate our devices into these networks. For example, some, one of the things he just recently put a very, very preliminary version of the paper on archive, Eden, uh, is that I just want to mention or highlight one of the data that, that we got is that uh, Eden had this, this experiment that he was generating photons through seeded for web mixing at Stony Brook and send them to the fiber that was 68 kilometers long to BNL to do a two photon resonance HOM measurement uh, on the other side. Of course, you have to always issue, and your big issue here is that these fibers are not maintaining polarization. So they use our polarization compensating device, our very, very first alpha version of these devices. And even that very, very basic device can allow them to improve their, their visibility of the interference measurement by more than 10% by just simply uh, compensating for the fiber loss. So we are slowly getting to a place that we are integrating or we are using our devices in different field tests. tests. And now we are talking with different networks like ESNets and, and the fiber providers to bring the fibers all the way to where we are at QNECT so we can create this long island wide network and in different places we can put our quantum devices. Okay, I'm just going to wrap this up by thanking our team here at QNECT. Uh, we are a very, very uh, new team, so we are expanding our team as, as I'm speaking. Uh, we are hiring more engineers and technicians. If you know anyone, send us our way. And of course, a lot of things, especially the last two slides, have been happened by much, much larger teams of scientists at Stony Brook and Brookhaven National Lab as well. Thank you all so much for, for your time so far. Feel free to ask me anything. I, I'm sorry, this went a little bit over time. Uh, thank you, Mehdi. Uh, I guess there'd be a round of applause if we were in uh, an actual room. Uh, but thank you very much. Um, uh, there, there have been some questions accumulating in the chat, so I'll just go in the order that they have been asked but not answered. So I'll skip those that have been answered. So Bruno, you have a question about end-to-end -end network performance. Would you like to ask it? Uh, okay, uh, can I read the question? So the question is, what end-to-end -end network performance have you achieved in actual devices, entanglements per second, fidelity, distance? Oh, that's that's a very good question. Yeah. So. Uh, at the end, I went a little bit faster, so so these things were not clear. So we have been researching on these quantum memories for literally like, well, since my PhD. So I, we started the research on that in 2013 or so at the Stony Brook University, and then we moved the research here at Kilnect, and our lab is quite new. So our lab became operational last August. So a lot of things that I showed about the quantum memory progress has happened in the past seven, six months or so. Unfortunately, because we are very new, uh, we still are working on these, so, so the entanglement forces are much more, we literally are setting up the setup uh, right now to, to achieve them. So the best I can tell you is uh, the ones that are in Eden is building in his lab that are very similar to this. The rate of those sources are still low. They are around like 5 to 10 uh, kilohertz. And in terms of the best publications that I could find on these atomic sources, the best rate was 18 kilohertz, that 2019 paper that they follow up with the paper in 2020 also. Uh, so these rate of these entanglement sources, if they're not multiplexed, the rates are not uh, that that impressive. Of course, again, they're narrow photons, blah, blah. So, so more useful for us, but the rate is limited. Our hope is to bring them to megahertz, but because we're using atoms, there's usually a hard limitation at some point because it takes the atoms a while to, to pump and then bring things back. Uh, so, so the timelines, the, the line bits of the atoms are always going to be the fundamental limitations of how fast these sources can work. So our entanglement sources are unfortunately right now very, very pre pre preliminary. Uh, so, so it's hard to say what is an end-to-end -end, uh, performance. Uh, but what's going to limit us the most in terms of rates and everything is not necessarily the entanglement source nor the quantum memories. It's the time if, if we are not multiplex, which these basic first versions are not multiplex, is the time that we have to wait for a successful uh, swapping to happen and the time that it takes for us to know. So the repeater that I was showing, what is limiting it the most, and that's why my 
y-axis was starting from a rate of 10 to the power of negative two. So even the rate was not, you're not even gonna get one photon per second if, if you use these protocols without really multiplexing. It's, it's because what is limiting me is the time that I need to wait for my photons to travel, let's say 50 miles or 50 kilometers, get a successful swapping, and then something has to tell me back again, 50 kilometers of travel that, that successfully happened so I can release the photons from the, the quantum memory. So the initial rates of a not multiplex networks is gonna be very, very low. We, as quote and unquote scientists, don't really care about that because we always look at it as a challenge that as long as we can show that this rate is better than direct fiber transmission over the distances, then the next state is the engineering of making it multiplex. And then now if I have uh, a thousand, ten thousands of these going at the same time, I can increase my rate, well, rather, well, with the same factor of my multiplexing. I hope that was the question. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, well, Bruno uh, can confirm in chat or not. Uh, Patrick asked a question, but Mal answered in the chat. So for the interest of time, I'm going to skip that one. There's a question from Thank Chongang. You all for answering the questions. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, Chongang, would you like to ask your question? Uh, uh, would you like to ask your question or should I ask her your question? Uh, you, you, you can just read the question, please. Okay. So the, uh, the question was, wonder what's the current maturity of quantum measurement, including bell state measurement or other types of quantum measurements, for example, in terms of accuracy, hardware complexity and availability slash cost? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't think in terms of availability slash cost there are out there yet, at least not that any that I know. So it's not very, very well. One thing that's going to make them a little bit exp expensive is that you need four single photon uh, counters. If you are in a very, very basic level of these experiments, as we are, for example, because the very fair first field tests are going to be having very, very low rates, you cannot use conventional uh, uh, photon counters. So you have to use nanowires and stuff like this. And that will make it very expensive because those nanowire detectors are like in their each range of 50 to 100. Uh, thousand dollars so you're talking about at least two thousand two hundred thousand dollars worth of detectors for for those uh, the the device itself is very very simple yeah it's just literally it splits the photons in in four paths so that's that's not gonna cost that much so the device itself might be like 10k but this uh, detectors eventually of course when the rate increases we can get to a point that we can use more conventional uh, spcms that are more in the range of 5k or so each uh, so, so it really that's going to really define how expensive they are, how successful they are, are defined by so many different things. Like a lot of the recent papers that are coming out from Caltech, Fermi Labs, or other researchers, they do have a relatively high success rate. Of course, they naturally fail 50% of the times because the the Bell state swapping has to map your map you into to only two of the states that it gets mapped out of the four are the ones that can give you the information you need to continue your swapping. So even if it was everything was perfect, you would still be stuck at 50% success rate. But what reduces the success rate usually is the indistinguishability of the photons and the timing, like how well you could manage to get them there at the same time. So a lot of the ones that you see in research labs or the ones that they use their own fiber pool and stuff like this is relatively highly efficient, but that's mainly because it's much, much easier to time everything precisely if you're in a lab or to use a fiber that's, for example, polarization maintaining so you don't have the issues uh, with these things. I am pretty sure the more we do these networks out there, this, this, the, the swapping rate is not going to that easily be anything better than 10% in the near future. But, but again, it's really a matter of more engineering slash increasing the rate so you can reduce the cost while increasing the efficiency. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, since we're uh, kind of just a bit beyond time, there's one more question from Kian, and uh, we'll we'll, we'll uh, have this question uh, and wrap up. Uh, I would just before I ask it, I would just like to remind everybody uh, to fill in the blue sheets uh, at the bottom of uh, the link that I posted, where I'm also keeping uh, the Q and A notes. Um, uh, so, so far, we have uh, 21 names on the blue sheets, and we peaked at about 70 people here in the uh, in the room. So, <laughs> yes. So whilst uh, <laughs> yes, so so, so please pl pl uh, please follow the link, and whilst uh, you you can do that, I will ask the last question. So it's a question from uh, so again, Kian, would you like to ask that in person, or shall I? 
Uh, no, I can uh, I can go for it as well. Um, yeah, because you mentioned uh, uh, ent entangled photon pair generation rates, and I was at first I was wondering how much filtering you would have to do after, or if that number was already included in those uh, rate numbers. Um, then Bruno answered that, uh, or sorry, uh, Mael, sorry, um, answered that these rates are after filtering process. Yes. So yes, my yes. follow-up question would then be, what is then your expectance entangling rate? Of these different sources together. Also, mean after we do the swapping. Uh, no, of the um, the you know the entangling rate of these two. Uh, uh, I guess it's swapping. Yeah. So the the after the first bell state measurement that you do. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so these these rates are always going to be very very affected by several things. Honestly, the the yeah. So that's the. Uh, I don't want to go like 50 slides back, but this is recorded. Fortunately, it's the oh, actually I can skip here to show this. Yeah, so the expected rates are very, very low. So if we start with like uh, 10K or 100K or so, the expected rate after one successful node, which is like 100 uh, in, in our 140 kilometers long, the rate is going to mm -hmm. come from around 10, starting from 10K to one photon every 100 seconds. Yeah, 10 to the power of negative two. You're going to lose a lot because you still have a lot of fiber loss. You're still using like uh, 70 kilometers or so the fiber loss itself uh, and the memory loss and the successful swapping loss and all those things. So your rate is very, very low at the beginning if you do not do any multiplexing and it's a lot also limits you. So it's not about how fast the memory is or how fast the entanglement generation itself is. It's all about how long it takes for the photons to arrive and you do the synchronization and make sure everything happened uh, successfully. So without multiplexing or, or a very proper or to optimize protocol, the original rates are going to be very, very low after you swap. Okay, thank you for the explanation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, you might wonder why, why we do this if the rates are going to be so low, but that's pretty much how the very initial versions of the current internet was also. Yeah, uh, all that matters for us to show that this device at, at this stage right now, that these devices really work together and when they work together, they can beat the loss in the fiber because that's pretty much the rate you also expect. No matter how amazing your entanglement source is, if you just directly send them to fibers, you barely gonna if the fiber is long. You're not going to get anything once every 100 years or so. Yeah. Uh, so, all we care about is to show that these things can work together, be integrated using the telecom fibers, and give you a better rate. And then we and a lot of hopefully researchers around the world will kick, uh, kick up our engineering part and the protocol parts to make them significantly more optimized, significantly more high rate and multiplex. So, we can bring this to something that is reasonably meaningful for applications. Yeah. Um uh, what, what, is there is there room for one more question, perhaps? Uh, yeah, if, 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 sure. I'll, I'll just ask her. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So I was also wondering about the surrounding hardware that you have to build uh, to get this to work, because you mentioned you need, you know, all these, um, all this extra hardware, also in terms of timing and in terms of uh, frequency locking, I guess. Um, how how mature do you see this, and and if and at, at what level is it, and how much effort do you see that that has to be uh, put into in the future? Okay, that's a very good question. So, so far for, for the stage that we are, we are developing uh, seven devices. Three of them are the main ones, the swapping memory and source of so four side devices that they, they, they are for the hard auxiliary hardware that we're using. But that is literally the stage that we are. Yeah, so our understanding of networking is very, very limited. That's the main reason we wanna do this field test because the more we do this field test, the more we realize the parts that we are missing and we need to develop. So these timings and the polarization compensators of the things are like the more obvious things that you definitely need. Yeah, so that's we're, we're really not that good when it gets to classic digital communication and stuff. Uh, they are relatively mature. So our plan is on our side to have all of these out. Fortunately, we do have a good mixture of uh, physicists, uh, machine learners and, and engineers right now in our team. Uh, so we're really hoping that at least the alpha version or the beta version of these devices are all ready by the end of this year. We, we do have the uh, the locking devices, for example, ready. The very first version of the uh, polarization and stabilization device has already been tested. The problem with it is that it does the job, 
but it's all the matter of like how long downtime it needs like compared to the network. So right now, for example, it works with like a 10% downtime, it can do it, but, but we want something that is hopefully like less than 1% downtime and it's much, much faster in, in bringing everything back to, to the nodes. Our, uh, what is his name? The, the Q-Sync right now, the, the synchronization devices right now works in, in a, a nanosecond scheme. So we're still like a little bit different from, from the scheme that brings us to sub nanosecond. So all these devices are in a good scale, but that's right now based on our current understanding of the what network requires, yeah? As more we're doing these things and field testing, the more we realize the complexity of the situation and then the more we need to make them perform better over time. Uh, great. Thanks, Mehdi. So with that, uh, let's wrap up. Thank you very much, Mehdi, for this talk. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I hope uh, that all the participants actually learned a lot. Uh, so uh, if, if I don't know if Mehdi and Mal or people from Connect are in the QRG mail list, if not, I invite you to join. Uh, and for those who are actually uh, managed to find their way into this call and are not on the mailing list, I also encourage you to join the QRG mailing list. Uh, with that, okay, thank you very much, and I hope to see you on the mailing list or at an IETF meeting. Um, awesome, thank you so much, guys, for having me.